Hello everyone, thanks for joining me today. Um, it's very special that you could uh, make it for something to me that is quite a big dream. Um, I've been, especially because of all the weird stuff we're going through right now, so I'm really, really excited to show you something that I thought was a really cool pattern. Um, there's a couple questions, if you want to ask them, please put them in the program. There's a question part in the tab and there's a poll, so if you want to take part of it, please feel free. There's also a handout section, so uh, if you see, you can like download the PDF already. Um, I think we're going to maybe uh, wait just a couple minutes uh, for see if anyone else decides to join, but we're about to get started in about the next minute. So, let me start here. So, how does Schuberg Phyllis stay in control? This is uh, something that I think was uh, really cool. I'm a big fan of like looking for hyperscale patterns. So the second that I kind of saw this thing that was floating around you, I was really interested to see it. Um, today we're going to start with a little introduction, and I'm going to just explain who I am and who I'm, who my friend is here, and who we're going, what we're going to show you. Um, obviously. Uh, I am David Webster. I'm an AWS technical practice lead at Schuberg Phyllis. Uh, I love all things hyperscale. I'm particularly fond of learning things that are AWS from, uh, from customers, from teams internal here. And to be honest, I like all things AWS from cloud formation all the way to um, AR services. Today, I'm going to be presenting with my good friend Juan Manuel Gomez, who's an AWS solution architect. He's especially good at Control Tower, so I look forward to seeing some of the things he wants to show you. Oh yes, and uh, the best part is uh, he's actually got something really cool installed for you because we've, um, we're going to try to do a live demo, so this is particularly exciting to me. So, without further ado, and that being done, I'm going to hand over to one who's going to do part one on, how, um, on AWS Control Tower as an overview. And then I'm going to jump in after that with part two of how we stay in control. Thank you, David. Pleasure. Pleasure, one. Okay. We share my screen. Can you see it? Yeah, it looks great. Cool, awesome. So, well, as, I, as um, David said, I am Juan, and I am a solutions architect here based in the UK, London, and um, I look after public sector customers uh, aligned with in the education segment, and also I am a specialist on the management tools and governance uh, technical field community, uh, and well, one of the services that fit under that umbrella of services that we support is Control Tower. I've been with AWS uh, since 2015, so I've been here for years and, and a half. Um, uh, and well, I, I am very passionate about how we can help customers um, to achieve an operational excellence based on our well architecture framework. And, and well, when we launched this service, AWS Control Tower it blew my, my head because um, in, in the past, customers need to um, create their own landing zones, their own um, environment. And now with AWS Control Tower, we want to make it easier uh, for everyone to build well-architected uh, environments on AWS, right? So. Uh, in my presentation, I will uh, do a quick overview of the main features of AWS Control Tower, and then I want to jump straight into the AWS console, and I will show you those features uh, and how they work, so you can get a feel of uh, how you would implement Control Tower in your organization. So uh, we want to balance the needs of builders and central cloud IT. So what we see in our customers is that so enterprise have had to make traditional compromises between needs of builders and cloud IT. Uh, builders like you love the speed and agility that AWS provides, 
uh, then while central proteins wants to govern with central controls, right? So we need to find a balance between builders and, and cloud IT. So builders can stay agile, okay, can they uh, innovate and enterprise customers with um, like a solid cloud IT environments can keep governance at the scale of those accounts. So AWS offers a set of management and governance services to help our customers improve business agility and maintain governance control, right? So when IT deploys management and governance services on AWS, they can support innovation, unlock provisioning bottlenecks, and improve their security and compliance posture, enhance operational efficiency, and reduce cost, right? Uh, and for that purpose, uh, we have a set of services, a set of um, um, pillars that we call enable, provision, and operate, right? And control tower will fit under the enabling uh, pillar, right? But if you see this slide, you can see that there are multiple services that in summary um, will help you to innovate faster right and um and apply the and you can apply them at the scale right so what is control tower it is a new service uh recently new it, it was uh launched initially in 2019 and um, it's that offer the easiest way for organizations to set up and, go, and govern an aws environment at the scale so with control tower Customers can enable, provision, and operate their environment for both business agility and governance at a scale. So why customers use Control Tower? So first, it set up a best practice AWS environment in a few clicks, so actually two clicks. A standardized account provisioning, centralized policy management, enforce governance and compliance proactively. So we will see uh, guardrails there enable end user self-service so you can delegate to end users um, how they provision their environment on aws so particularly for developers i think this is quite useful because when, when they need a new environment to do experimentation uh, they will go to a console where they can provision new accounts um, on an, on their aws environment uh, and that innovation is going to be isolated from their production environment. So it is a safe way to implement a control tower, uh, to, to implement new new accounts. And then you will gain peace of mind because you get a centralized dashboard where you will see the status of your landing zone, and what, which things are uncompliant, which things are compliant, uh, and also you will get um, a console using AWS SSO, where you will be able to basically configure users, groups, and permissions, and manage uh, identity and access from a centralized way, right? So when you have one account, you will probably be familiar with IIM, and you'll be able also to create local users, groups, and assign roles. Uh, so th that that's great, but it's a model that doesn't scale when you have hundreds of accounts, when you have thousands of accounts. So the idea of using control tower as well is to have a scalable environment that lets you uh, grow in your AWS presence from the starting point, which is when you deploy control tower. So now I will jump into my console straight away and we will review the key features of the service. So basically, um, before, uh, after you log in into the AWS uh, environment using AWS SSO, you will basically uh, get into your portal where you have a list of the AWS accounts that you have on your landing zone, right? And um, because of my user is administrator, I have access to uh, most of the accounts they are in, in my particular environment right so this will be the portal that you will access after you enter your email and password this portal uh, for you that you may be part of a bigger organization 
Um, so it's, uh, it's provided by AWS SSO, which is our single sign-on service, and uh, can be integrated with other IDPs with, for federation, right? So if your organization use Azure AD, you can basically link AWS SSO with Azure AD. If you, for example, uh, you you use Okta or you use uh, Pings, for example, you can also integrate SSO with uh, those tools as well and use the same identities you use in your IDP services into AWS SSO. So now my user has, for example, this role assigned, I will log in into the management console, but notice you can also use this service to log in into the command line and do your scripting or, or manage AWS account, your AWS account through the CLI, right? So I will click here. And this is basically authenticating me within my master account, right? And here in services, we will look for control tower. And now what we are doing is the dashboard, right? So one of the key feature of control tower is that as soon as you deploy the service, everything is green and you will get a dashboard where you have a centralized way to control your resources in your landing zone. This is something that we were missing on the solution AWS landing zone, if you were familiar with it, uh, but it's one of the key features of this new service. So let's go through the uh, dashboard so you can see what you can uh, what you can control from here, right? So in this case, we get a, an environment summary, right? So we have five organizational units, 12 accounts in this environment. Here we have guardrails. I will go to explain guardrails in a minute, but basically these are uh, config rules or service control policies that we apply to the environment to control what things can be done and what things are monitored by AWS config. Here we get a clear dashboard of not compliant resources. So based on the guardrails I configure, there are some resources which are not compliant, right? And I need to take an action in order to remediate them. Here I have the organizational units which are enrolled into control tower. Uh, and here I can see uh, which OUs are compliant, which OUs are not compliant. The same with the accounts. So I get a summary of the accounts, the account email, link to the account name, the organizational unit, and also the compliance status. Um, and here I can see the state. So here the state could be enrolled or it could be unmanaged, right? So control tower supports existing accounts in your organization. So you can deploy control tower on an existing organization, which was one of the limitations that we have in the past, but this feature is available since April. So customers who has an existing environment can deploy control tower uh, on their existing environment. And then here at the end, we have guardrails, right? So to explain guardrails, I will move into the guardrail section here in the left. So here we have a set of, a set of policies that you can see that we are applying to the environment. So these policies are predefined. So they are created automatically when you deploy a default environment on control tower. And we only apply by default to your environment, the mandatory guardrails. So there are three types of guardrails. So you have mandatory guardrails, you have a strongly recommended, and you also get elective guardrails, right? So mandatory means that those are enforced by default. A strongly recommended and elective are guardrails that we uh, provide as part of the control tower service, and they are based on our well architected framework policies and recommendations. So the idea is you can evaluate them on our documentation. You will find full detail of what they do and how they impact into your environment. And if you want, you can enable them per OU, right? So when you de decide to implement a guardrail, so that guardrail is basically targeting 
an organizational unit in your organization. So be conscious that when you apply that degree, it will impact into all the accounts which are under your OU, right? Uh, and now just for for an example. So let's say that we we explore um, this Gabriel. So this allow EBS volumes that are an attached to an EC2 instance. So basically this Gabriel will be monitoring if you have an attached volumes into EC, uh, in your account without being attached to EC2 instances. What this means is that basically for example, you create an EC2 instance, you delete it, and the EBS volume is there and attached to anything. And it means that it is spending money uh, for maintaining that EBS volume there when actually nobody is using it, right? So if you want to detect that, uh, you can enable this Gabriel. Uh, in my case, it is enabled on this organizational unit right, on the research group organizational unit, uh, and it is impacting on these four accounts, right? And what we can see here uh, very easily and from a centralized place is that this account is not compliant, right? And if I go here to the non-compliant resources, I can see the volumes which are unattached from any EC2 instance in which region they are, I can see the account ID. So I can, by getting visibility of this, I can either contact the user who owns this resource or as an auditor or administrator, I can get into the account and remediate the problem, right? So this is uh, applies for all the guardrails, right? And another thing that I wanted to show is that well, I explained you what, what this is, but if you don't have an idea what this is, you get here uh, the Gabriel name, category of the Gabriel, and also the description. And here we have a backend Gabriel component. So in this case, this Gabriel, because this um, a recommended Gabriel, it is on based on an AWS config rule. So if you click here, you can see what we are doing in order to implement this Gabriel. So, which is important because you can understand uh, what what is it, right, and, and how you can manage it. Then, um, so this is what I wanted to share about uh, guardrails. And um, luckily, we have more than thirty guardrails at the moment. And every time that the product team um, decides to implement a new guardrail, to release a new guardrail, those are pushed. To all of our customers using Control Tower automatically, right? And they are disabled by default, and you need to come here and decide if you want to uh, implement them into your um, well into your environment. So I hope um, it, it is clear. If not, feel free to drop a question into the into the chat, and we will try to answer all the questions uh, through the webinar or we will get back to you by email afterwards. And so the second thing I wanted to show here is the user and access section. So this is basically uh, run on top of AWS SSO. Uh, but before we create a set of permission sets that you can use to uh, manage your environment, right? So those are created by default. This is my user portal uh, URL. So from where I will manage all the accounts in the environment. And by default, we use uh, an AWS SSO directory, which is built in within Control Tower. But as I said before, you can integrate it with Azure AD and other services uh, as well. So if I go here to view uh, my AWS single sign on configuration, so this is going to be your centralized place to manage all the identities in your landing zone using Control Tower. So here you will find your AWS accounts. Right, so automatically when a new account is provisioned, it is populated in here, and you can see which permissions are assigned to to the account. And here, as any directory application, you will see my users. So now I am logging with with this one, and if I access into this user, I will see that I am a member of two groups. Right, so the AWS Control Tower admins group, which basically is uh, admin rights to AWS Control Tower. 
and then the AWS Account Factory Group, right? Which let me um, have access to a service catalog in order to see which accounts are provisioning. So, so far we have reviewed the dashboard, we also review guardrails, and we also review AWS SSO. Now I want to show you uh, how you provision accounts into Control Tower, right? So again, from a centralized place, here uh, we have a setting called Account Factory. So this setting works on top of AWS Service Catalog, which is a service that you need to think about a gateway to access to other services on, on an automated way using AWS, right? So from Service Catalog, you can call a transform a Terraform script, you can call a CloudFormation script. So the idea here is that you will configure a, a blueprint for your new AWS account in the environment. So here I will go to edit. And here I can say if my new account, we have internet access, uh, internet access via the subnet. So how many private subnets I want, the AP range I will have, and in which regions uh, I will deploy control tower, uh, the VPC on, on these new regions. When I am sure that, for example, I want this configuration, I save. Perfect. So this is my account factory configuration. Every new account will have this configuration. And then I will click on enroll account. And what happened here is that I need to provide a set of uh, information in order to provision this new account in my landing zone. That new account is going to be a regular AWS account member of my organization. And we'll also have uh, all the guardrails and the VPC configuration uh, that I decided to implement through the account factory, right? So in this case, I will create an email and Here I need to enter an email that will I, I will be using to access through my SSO panel. So this is configured automatically. And then here I need to uh, select in which account and which OU I need to put my, my new account. So when you select this, you click enroll account and this will basically kick off the process to enroll that new account into your environment, right? Usually takes around between 10 to 20 minutes because it creates the new AWS account and also deploy a set of guardrails and VPC configuration uh, for, for you. So this is what I wanted to show you on the console. I will get back to my slide. And I want to say that, um, well, Control Tower is, uh, has no additional charge. So it is a free service. And we only charge for the underlying services that Control Tower use, right? So you have AWS config rules, AWS service catalog products, and you have also login, right? Because we create a centralized login account to store all the cloud trail logs. So all the logins are generating charges on S3. So depending on the, the usage you give to your landing zone, you will have more or less charges. And the service is generally available in US East, North Virginia, Ohio, US West Oregon, Ireland, and Sydney. And to finalize, I will share the slide deck afterwards, but basically we have a set of resources and that it would be cool if you can take a look. So for example, here, AWS Control Tower Labs. So these are a set of more or less 15 labs that will give you a lot of hands-on experience to go from a basic user to an expert in control tower and they are free there so you only need to um, to use your aws account uh, to to experiment and see how they work and then i will share a list of links that you can basically um, see and, and found them useful in order to get more knowledge about this this service uh, and this one is a new one that I want to highlight. So AWS Config Conformance Pack is a new feature for AWS Control Tower uh, for our governance services that basically you can test all your guardrails 
in an existing environment without deploying control tower. So that when you deploy control tower, uh, you don't get any surprise on what resources are going to be uncompliant. So you can test that before deploying control tower if you want. So I hope you enjoy my presentation. I will stay here and try to answer questions uh, that appear there in the chat. Otherwise, um, while you have my contact details, feel free to ping me and I will uh, pass the ball back to David now so he can uh, continue with his presentation. One second. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Juan. That was great. No problem. And I will change to David. All yours now. Thanks. So like uh, Juan said, you know, there's like a lot of cool things there. I've personally done that control tower lab and I find it really good. It like helped me learn a lot of stuff. And um, but now the fun really begins, you know, like all things AWS. I love it because it's few buttons to get started, but then you really want to get deep into this thing and you start exploring those boundaries and you start figuring out maybe you need to do a couple of different things. And that's really a little bit of the focus of how Schubert-Phillips stays in control. So how does Schubert-Phillips stay in control? Well, we have an agenda for this. It's starters, who is Schubert-Phillips? What do our customers want to do on AWS? How do we evolve the shared responsibility model to actually help our customers? And then some lessons learned and some future plans. Who is Schuberg Phyllis? Well, Schuberg Phyllis is an AWS advanced consulting partner. We're an MSP partner and a well-architected partner. We won the awesome award 2019 and we currently have 75 certifications and we're looking to make ourselves a premier. A list of our customers, uh, we, these are the customers we serve in Netherlands and around the world. They range from banks to retail, to even the, the postal network in, in Netherlands. We believe at Schubert Phyllis that the right combination of smart people in the right setting with the right intentions can achieve anything. We have one key objective, 100% customer satisfaction. Although this isn't exactly, we don't believe 100% satisfied people as possible, we constantly work towards getting more towards that 100%. Giata, who's an independent uh, consultant who researches into performance companies, uh, consulting companies in Netherlands, uh, has said across three different pillars in terms of recommended by customers, trusted by customers, and satisfaction by customers that we're doing a really good job. So what do our customers want to do on AWS? Most customers want to be FOST. From day one, they want to be building, and in a few weeks, they want to already have a POC or be live. They want to be safe. This means 24-7, 365 compliance, and to honestly always be raising the bar on security. They want to be continuous, which means thousands of daily changes to production or to any environment. And by being safe and continuous, the irony is that they can actually be very fast. And by being very fast, they can deliver value as early as possible. So which path to choose? It seems like there's a couple things that we're talking about here between accounts. Do I choose the single account or multiple accounts? Well, what people tend to do is they go, you know, this app has, these apps have common backends, they have common security boundaries. Let's put them all in one account. Uh, you know, like what possibly could go wrong with that kind of idea, right? Or they think, well, actually, you know, AWS came along and they told us about these accounts or resource containers things. So why don't we take the apps, split them up as much as possible and put them in as many accounts as possible? You know, I mean, this, this is actually the way forward and that's what I think everyone has done. So what is, what is wrong with everything in one account? Well, two things you'll notice pretty quickly is that it becomes difficult to like bill, separate the billing boundaries. How do you know how much one app is using and how much another app is using? So when you try to cost these things, it's always a problem. Single security boundary. The team that's working on the apps in this account probably all now is using the exact same credentials. So they have access maybe to applications they shouldn't even have access to. 
So what you tend to find is we increase our IAM complexity and our tagging complexity to remedy these problems. But that actually doesn't solve anything because eventually you reach the limits of IAM. So then what about multiple accounts? That's the only <laughs> other path. Well, you know, they solves the billing and security boundaries because now you've separated that problem, but there's another problem. What happens now when you have your accounts and you want to connect it to the on-prem network? Well, you find some network team, the right amount of people in the right order, you ask the person for a SIDA address, and maybe in a week or so later, you have your SIDA address and you can like use 100 um, RPs in your VPC. Well, also, it's pretty hard to, if you have thousands of these accounts, peer, these, peer them now. It almost becomes impossible. And one of the other really weird things that we found was it costs about $30 a NAT gateway per subnet. So in an account, you're looking at about $100 an account with three NAT gateways. And if you have 10,000 accounts, you're looking at a million dollars just on NAT gateways. So what do we need to do? Well, we think we need to evolve the shared responsibility model. We allow workloads to do what they've always done. They bring their app to AWS, they build their app and they work on that, and they make sure that it's well architected and checks all of those security boundaries and problems. So what we wanna do as the platform is we wanna be built on the well architected. We wanna take some of the responsibility that the workload team would normally worry about and we wanna take control of it just to make their life easier and speed them up. Then AWS, we let them do what they've always done brilliantly. Keep our infrastructure perfect. So how do we evolve this shared responsibility? Well, us personally, we use Control Tower. We use um, some of our own flavored extensions. Uh, and we use a specific networking pattern with a twist, something that I said in the beginning of this presentation was a pattern I had never really seen before. So what control gives us? Out of the box, it gives us a landing zone with AWS best practices. It gives us account factory, so we can one button click account creation. And every account that's created is bootstrapped to the log logging and audit accounts of AWS already in control tower. So we don't have to worry about compliance in terms of logs and security, all of our events are fed to a central source. We also get preventative SCPs, so we can control things like accounts can't turn off CloudTrail logging. And we get guardrails that lets us know when things, when storage devices aren't using encryption. It also really gives us the ability to manage our organizations in some kind of rational way. Although we have noticed you have to manage them in a very horizontal way. So workloads. A workload to us is the same thing as an OU. It's basically a wrapper around environmental accounts, your development, test, acceptance, and prod, or in AWS language, pre-prod and prod. Each account can have your one to N apps, and then we use SCPs to make sure that the accounts and workloads each have unique settings. We extend these practices out of the box even further. For every account that's created, we bootstrap it with IAM Access Analyzer to make sure we know what the resources are doing inside the account. We add Inspector so that we know that all the EC2s that are running, we see their findings. We use Firewall manage, Manager to control the security group rules. And we use Guard Duty for intelligent threat detection. We send all of these findings to the security hub inside that account, which then sends them to the security account inside in our master control tower core OU. This way we can get our seam out of the box. We also choose to use some non-cloud native tools for our foundational services, which are all running in a giant Kubernetes cluster. Um, we use HashiCorp Vault, GitLab, AWX, and a few others. We just think that we know how to scale them a little bit more and the security that HashiCorp Vault gives us might be slightly more that we could ask for. Pipelines. 
So when your workload is created, each account that is created is bootstrapped with two pipelines. Out the box, you'll get one pipeline so that you can change the settings of your account. So say you didn't have access to a specific resource and you really needed it. You, the dev, day one can change that and say, hey, no, actually, I need access to Cloud HSN. And you send in the merge request. It would be reviewed by the platform team at a four hours principle, and it would be submitted, and you would get your resource access that day. The other pipeline you have complete control over, and that's to manage the infrastructure that's inside your account. We also use EC2 Image Builder. EC2 Image Builder is great, and honestly, since I've started playing with it, I've really enjoyed it. It solves a lot of AWS problems really easily. It allows you to build, test, and distribute your AMRs from a central location to any region and any AWS account, up to 10,000 so far. And now for the really fun bit, the networking with a twist. This to me was quite interesting. As you can see from the picture, we create one networking account. So we have tens of thousands of accounts, and one of these accounts is the networking account. We then take this networking account and we create four VPCs inside it, a fifth for the shared VPC, but we're not going to talk about that right now. So the dev VPC is connected to a dev account. The test VPC is connected to a test account. And these accounts are wrapped in workloads. So we create hundreds and thousands of workloads, each with their DTAP accounts in them. And then we use one single network account to share all the VPCs amongst them. We really went all in with the shared VPC pattern. And we share all of these VPCs with the Resource Access Manager. What does this actually mean to a workload? Well, Workloads no longer worry about networking. They don't have to worry about VPCs, root tables, or any of these things. And you don't have to worry that some dev is making a huge mistake in his routing or even in his VPC. And we give this network, this centralized networking account to the NOC team. And we say, hey, listen, you guys want to go crazy with Knuckles? It's all yours now. Workloads only actually have to worry about firewalling. The only thing a workload has to do is say who is allowed inbound into that workload. It works the exact same way as whitelisting. So, and because all of the workloads are in the same VPC, they dynamically resolve each other's security groups. So one team needs to speak to another team to get the access to the, that microservice or whatever they need. It's as simple as that. Out of by design, you get high availability. Because we've created the centralized networking account and we've shared it with everyone, we've stuck to AWS best practices. We've created it across three AZs with public and private subnets. You don't have to worry about it. You get high availability out of the box. This pattern also scales globally. What we learned was all we needed to do was create a centralized networking account in a different region use transit gateway into region peering and connect them and presto there we had it we had a global setup platform and the particularly cool part is this you get to see all your ENRs in one place this is the networking account you go to your networking account you can see all the ENRs there all your root tables all your VPCs everything it provides a single pane of glass for your, for your network operation team. So in conclusion, what you get is for all your workloads, you don't have to worry about networking. You get SIEM out of the box. And as a total, we've calculated it across the well-architected review, you get 15 best practices as your workload is just starting out so they can go as fast as they want. Some lessons learned. If your complexity is growing and you're reaching limits, re-examine your approach. What we generally find is this speaks to the IAM tagging and the IAM policies, but when you start doing something wrong in AWS, the complexity starts growing to, to the point where you actually hit the limits and you can't go any further. It's best to perhaps maybe look at the problem from a different angle. By creating centralized networking and security, we're not trying to 
say everything should be centralized. In fact, we're trying to have less reliance on centralized, like central engineering teams. We want their job to be easier so that workload teams can be faster. Something else we learned that's really hard is having that infrastructure as code mindset. Constantly realizing that everything you do must be automated, versioned, so that you can stay consistent. And also, as one said earlier, we try not to touch anything AWS. We really want to follow the control tower upgrade path. So any future plans? Well, the future plans that would be nice is it would be nice to automate an APR for our SSO and control tower. We recently, AWS Detective was launched and we'd really like to start using it. We really are passionate about mission critical engineers who love AWS. And we want to continue to partner with Amazon as much as possible and look forward to the future. Thanks for all of your time and I've really enjoyed this and I look forward to presenting for you guys again. I really hope you'll follow us on one of these three things. I thought GitHub was the most important so you could see our code. And thank you for your time. Um, let me see if there are any questions. Are you here, Mr. Manuel? Uh, one, are you here? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, yeah, I didn't receive any questions. Uh, so, so yeah, so far, so so good. Okay, cool. So um, I've finished the presentation. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, maybe let's take a look at some of the questions. We've got some spare time. So, um, Mr. Mark wanted to know: Does Control Tower support automation, CRCD around existing service catalogs? Bigger question: Why Control Tower and not Landing Zone? Sure. <laughs> so um, Control Tower gives us like a lot of the best practices out of the box. Landing zones are definitely also possible, but they tend to be a lot more custom set up and the people who need to run them, you have to actually understand that cloud formation very well. I'm not sure if there's uh, something more you'd like to add, uh, Mr. Juan? Yeah, so the other thing I wanted to add is that um, so at the moment landing zone uh, we we stop receiving um, new updates at the end of 2020. So the the path to go I think is using control tower uh, and from your previous question uh, about if control tower supports um, customizations. So control tower now supports existing environments and. Uh, meaning that you can integrate with service catalog as well uh, if you have existing products and also we have something called a uh, life cycle events that you can use to do your own customization after the product is deployed so basically trigger a cloudwatch event and then start another script and deploy new resources into that account so yeah so i, I would say um between control tower and landing zone if you need something very customized, then maybe landing zone could be something that fit your organization. But by default, I would try to encourage you to look at uh, Control Tower. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Paul Zietzman asked, is there a way to build nested OU structures? Seems the root OU always needs to be the parent. So you have a master account right and then all the use are below that master account right and at the moment control tower uh, supports a flat organization with multiple OU in the in the same level uh, it is on the roadmap uh, but i'm not sure the timeline uh, that we will be supporting uh, multiple so nested OUs in the organization yes uh, that's something we've experienced as well it's you have to actually have them flat the whole OU structure is completely flat yes yeah um let's see mr mark asked another question does control tower also support custom guardrails i think not yet but i think in the future they are planning that on their roadmap as well if i'm right yeah yeah, yeah. so basically now you can create guardrails uh, using aws config or using service control policies outside control tower but you won't get any visibility of those guardrails into the dashboard 
Um, in the future, uh, for probably this year, we will have custom guardrails supported um, on the environment as well. It's something which is on the roadmap. Okay, cool. Um, there's a lot of questions here. Another cool one I have to answer is from a guy called Jared Nord, and it says, how do you do internet-facing environments and egress? That That is the, a very interesting question. I didn't go into it too much detail, but the whole cool thing about this pattern with giving this NOC account now to um, you, uh, this net centralized networking account to your NOC teams is it's very easy for them to set up other subnets and other VPCs inside the account that become uh, places for RDS or RPS or if you want to do some kind of firewalling and stuff like that. So for intimate net facing environments and egress of traffic, you can we, we tend to leave it up to the NOC team's requirements, but we give it to them so that they can actually um, centralize that all through like a specific uh, VPC or subnet. Um, then when it comes to Alex uh, Ruttenstein, he asked uh, one a question in particular. He says, one, I was wondering how do you control changes across the entire stack that are executed online after provisioning? So if if you want to track changes um, on the environment after provisioning, they're going to go through CloudRail to a centralized repository on S3. I think, I'm not sure if he's asking that, uh, but if you want to use auditing and, and track changes done in the environment, they are all logged into CloudRail. Cool. Um, uh, Mr. Zietzman again asked, have you had a scenario where one team did something to use up all the available RPs in a shared VPC? This is something uh, many, obviously there's many different systems, right? We've been playing with Citrix, SAP. You've got to be very um, aware of what you're actually designing for. But one of the cool things that AWS did recently was they allow you to attach more SADAs to a VPC. So you can have a theoretical limit of uh, 300,000 RPv4 SAD uh, addresses per VPC. So if you have four VPCs, that's about 1.2 million um, addresses. So no, we haven't uh, gone over that yet. Um, let's see, maybe one last question from Mr. Hector. What would happen to a child account which is already attached to an OU in an AWS organization and then you move it under an OU managed by control tower in the same master account? So, so when, when you, this is basically enrolling an existing account into your environment. So by default, uh, those OUs that are not part of uh, the control tower deployment are unmanaged. Um, we provide a script on our documentation to extend governance to those unmanaged or, uh, or use an account into the environment, right? So by now you need to enable governance uh, in order to enroll an account into control tower by following the steps on that script and deploying. So basically what we do is deploy the CloudFormation uh, scripts, uh, stack sets, that hold the config rules. So basically we deploy that through that script and then that account is now enrolled and managed by Control Tower. Awesome, thank you. And um, yeah, I think that's any more questions that we have here, I might get back to you in the emails and um, please, we're gonna send you a follow-up email. Please don't hesitate to uh, uh, reach out to us and there's going to be a survey as well. I want to thank you all for your time. I know uh, time is valuable in, these, in, in this age and I want to thank you one and I want to thank everyone at Shubik Phyllis who uh, helped me make this possible and I hope you all have a great day. Cheers. Thanks one. Bye guys.